great panelists here with me today uh, to talk about developing models and dynamic models in transportation. Uh, before we get into the panelist introductions and the meat of the session, I wanted to lay out uh, on a slide here, if we could flip to that for a second, uh, what exactly we mean when we talk about dynamic models in transportation and, and all the things that are developing. So with this slide, uh, what this is, is a, it's an illustrative you know, set of companies. This is by no means comprehensive, uh, but with all the different business models, areas of innovation that are developing, it's, it's extremely rich across the entire transportation ecosystem. Everything from you know, the vehicle side of things, autonomous driving, uh, different controls, sensors, et cetera, uh, through different models that the OEMs are adopting with rental or with subscription services rather than leases, uh, all the way through to you know, what autonomy means in terms of business models, using autonomy as a, as a, uh, as a feature of the business model um, or as a service, not as a feature of the vehicle alone. So obviously the uh, activities that your Ubers and Lyfts, those sorts of companies are taking on. Um, but we should be, it would be uh, incomplete to leave it at just the cars that we talk about. We, we talk about bikes as a service, um, you know, city bikes, city rental shares, scooters, for those of you in San Francisco, Nashville, anybody? Probably not, but uh, yeah, with Bird, um, others that are flooding the cities. So, and different last mile transportations. We haven't even talked about electric buses yet today, but that's certainly one area that overlaps a lot with, uh, with the drivers of what we're talking about. So um, I just wanted to set the context here through this slide for all the different types of innovation that we are referencing. And in some cases, it's going to be implicit as we, uh, as we speak through what's going on. Um, and with that, let's flip back to the, uh, to the panelists. And yeah, if we could, Regina. Great to be here. Uh, my name is Regina Clulo. I am a former academic. I used to be a research scientist uh, at MIT, uh, Stanford, and UC Berkeley before I moved into the private sector, um, mostly building models to simulate the future of cities, um, but also for a time global aviation. Uh, and I recently formed a company called Populous, which is focused on helping cities and private mobility operators deliver safer and more efficient streets. Uh, one of the really big challenges that's evolved um, as many new private mobility services have emerged in cities, including ride-hailing services such as Uber and Lyft, car-sharing services, um, and now the scooter wars of spring 2018, is that a lot of cities are struggling to deal with these new innovative mobility options, um, particularly because they, just, they don't have very much information on how people are using them and how they're actually shaping people's transportation behavior. Um, and so what we provide at Populous is the best data on the adoption and utilization of these new services so that a multitude of players in the transportation ecosystem, including automakers, we have a couple of major automotive brands who are customers, um, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, um, and then the city of San Francisco can make decisions about how to plan policy and infrastructure. Um, and I'll go ahead and end there. Happy to take questions at the end. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Stuart Cohen uh, with, with uh, Stuart Cohen with Transform. I'm the founding executive director, and we've been around since 1997. Uh, and Transform is uh, a statewide nonprofit that works to promote transportation and land use solutions uh, that can help us create great communities where people can walk and bike and live affordably. Uh, while also meeting uh, our, our climate goals. Um, and uh, we basically operate at three levels, doing local pilot projects, uh, and then using our knowledge from those to uh, do our advocacy at the regional and state level. And uh, we just came out with a new strategic plan that bundles our work into three different areas. Uh, the first is our kind of core work of transportation that works, and that means helping shape transportation investments and policy um, everything from getting BART not to go to Livermore, which was our, uh, we were the lead campaigners for that, so they can invent, instead uh, reinvest in their core system and actually make BART work again, um, to, um, to working on the San Mateo County sales tax that's coming up and building a, 
uh, coalition, environmental and social justice coalition there. The second uh, project is disrupting inequity. Um, and with that, we are trying to make sure that all of these new mobility services really help uh, the most disadvantaged community members uh, and, and, have access and are accessible to all. And uh, for that, we've done things like led the equity outreach for Ford Go Bike. Uh, we're working with Prospect Silicon Valley uh, to help identify uh, an autonomous pilot in San Jose that'll help disadvantaged communities, things like that. And then finally, uh, a, an initiative called More Homes, Less Driving, uh, which is working to take some of what we've learned over the last 10 years of shaping transit-oriented development. So it has great transportation strategies built in, things like car sharing and bike sharing and transit passes. And with that, being able to dramatically reduce the amount of parking that's provided and make that case to the cities so we've cert certified 37 buildings, including a number here in San Jose, and now we're working to take those things um, uh, to scale at the regional and state policy. And I'll, I'm sure we'll get to talk about some of these initiatives. Thanks. Yes, sir. All right, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm Gary Miskell. I'm the Chief Information and Technology Officer at VTA. And of course, VTA is your local transit agency, which is all the buses and light rail. That's pretty easy, but we're also the congestion management agency which a lot of people aren't aware of. So we help plan roads or we plan uh, transit systems and we try to then go and get funding and work with the other local and city governments to try to also do transit-oriented uh, you know, uh, construction. We do uh, models for the county and for other counties, as a matter of fact, and do simulations to try to go and predict what the... Uh, Congestion will look like out two, four, five, 10, 20 you know, years in advance. So we uh, currently have 480 buses and we have uh, about 40 miles of uh, light rail. And we were put, you know, we typically run about uh, 48 million uh, trips a year, which has lately been dropping for a number of different reasons. And uh, which, by the way, matter of fact, all the transit agencies in the Bay Area have been having uh, ridership problems. We could always talk about that too as another time. Um, <clears throat> So uh, basically, all the things that we're trying to do is look at how we can improve the whole ITS transportation system within the county, as well as try to improve the congestion or, or you know, eliminate the congestion within the county. Thanks, Gary, and thanks, everybody. And so, uh, Gary, I'm going to pick up on where you left off talking about improvement. And uh, the description of our session overall was, you know, Examples of better ser uh, service solutions, models of transportation, et cetera. Which, when we talk about better, you know, what are some examples and specific metrics that you know, occur to or that each of you see in your day to day? Um, and uh, can you give us one or two examples that might be a little bit under the radar? Well, things that we're trying to look at, number one is, you know, we, we want to improve safety and security because if there is, you know, if the system's safer, if there's fewer accidents, you know, one of the things that we see is that, you know, part of the problem with congestion is, is that, you know, the traffic is moving slowly, but the second there's an accident, it moves not at all. And so the better, the better that we can make the highways, you know, safer, or we can make our transit system safer so that people aren't driving into us or vice versa, then, you know, that improves the whole, you know, you know the whole ecosystem within the area. Um, we're trying to also improve like the customer experience so that the mobility of the customer, so the customer knows, like, like on our express lanes, we can tell the customer on a mobile app what is the current pricing and what is the level of congestion that's going through like the 237 you know, uh, system. And then we got uh, both climate and the environment. So we are doing electric buses. <laughs> Um, so we've got five right now. Um, we're, we're doing the uh, final upgrades to or, or adding equipment into the uh, electric buses. Hopefully next month, which would be like tomorrow, uh, we'll be slowly starting to, to put those actually in revenue service. And then we're also working on trying to understand the best ways of charging and managing the electrical systems for dealing with you know large electrical fleets. Because if we were to electrify our entire fleet of just buses alone, is 56 megawatts every day of power. In, in case you want to know, that runs quite a few hundred homes in that. So. Uh, sure. <clears throat> so, 
So Transform likes to look at uh, a few different metrics, but the ones that I would choose uh, for, for now are how can we decrease overall vehicle ownership and, of course, decrease vehicle miles traveled overall? Uh, they, they are both important for different reasons. Uh, but, uh, you know, when, when you look kind of service by service, operator by operator, um, what you can tell with all these new services is what's the impact on people's psyche and their ability to either give up one of their existing vehicles or to not replace one. And we are seeing a, a real dip in vehicle ownership levels amongst people uh, in under 35. It's been happening for about 10 years. And part of that is moving back into the city's uh, you know, trend that's been happening. But a, a large part of it is all these new mobility services. So, so that's something that we like to keep our eye on and see how it's different uh, in, in different cities. Um, the, with, with VMT, vehicle miles traveled, uh, that's the ultimate metric for how we're doing with our transportation system because the more that kind of starts to creep back up and it has started to creep back up again after years, uh, some years of decline, um, it has a whole range of impacts uh, from safety on our streets and how congested our streets are uh, to of course our climate emissions and, and the demand for highway expansion. Uh, so, uh, so that's one. And then finally, with some of these new mobility services, I'll just say that we like to look at what is the share of low-income communities that are able to access the services and then actually use the service? One thing that we're really proud of is uh, the first round of Bay Area bike share had 1% of users uh, were low-income users. And then when uh, Motivate took it over and Ford uh, sponsored it as Ford Go Bike, uh, they made a real concerted push on equity, including a $5 first year fare instead of $149, which I paid. Uh, and uh, we were able to get the ridership with intensive community outreach so that it went from 1% to now nearing 20% of uh, the members are, are low income and their usage is just as high or slightly higher. So, so that, that's one final metric we like to look at. Um, so kind of picking, picking up on what Stuart mentioned, I also am interested in many of the same similar metrics. I previously as a researcher um, had released a report on the impacts of ride hailing services on a couple of key issues. One was traffic congestion, uh, vehicle miles traveled specifically, uh, transit utilization, how these services impact people's transit use. Is it going up or is it going down? Um, and then vehicle ownership. Uh, and so a lot of the headlines from the study that I released ended up picking up on the vehicle miles piece. Uh, it's essentially said that Uber and Lyft are causing congestion, which isn't actually what I specifically said. Um, it, what I found with evidence from seven major metropolitan areas in the United States, which is basically the best data set that currently exists, um, is that more people are utilizing services like Uber and Lyft um, in exchange for transit, um, in exchange for biking, in exchange for walking, and then also specifically are generating a lot of new trips, which in and of itself isn't a bad thing. It means that people have more places to go. It probably means that people are visiting restaurants that are probably seeing um, greater profitability. But um, in the end, when it comes to transportation planning, we do kind of need to know how many miles are going to be on the roads. Um, and the answer is there are currently more. Um, on the flip side, um, these services also are seeming to have some impact on people's decisions around vehicle ownership. So I've found that almost 9% of people have decided to get rid of a vehicle or delay the purchase of a vehicle, um, in part because they have access to multiple mobility services. Um, and so I think it's really important as we think about the future of mobility to keep in mind both the short range imp impacts, um, that is for that particular trip, what would you have otherwise done, um, walked, biked, used transit, not taking the trip at all. And then the longer range impacts, such as whether or not someone decides they need that first vehicle or in more cases, the second vehicle of their household. Um, and so I think these are the really important metrics that many cities need to measure. Um, as someone who used to build these forecasts for the Bay Area region, um, those are two of the key metrics that we need to know in order to forecast travel out for the next 30 years uh, and think about how to plan for the future of autonomous vehicles. Data is one of the major topics that popped up, uh, I think, in 
or you know, trends across all of your answers. But when we think about data and we think about you know, all that's available and that seems to be available or somebody's tracking it, but it's not shared equally across groups. And so you know, I'd be curious to hear from each of your perspectives, what are some of those challenges or lack of, uh, or lack of data sharing practices um, that you see and what are some of the implications of that? Uh, Gary, I'm gonna start back with you from the public sector side. Yeah, so there's actually quite a bit we're doing. Uh, so first, from just a VTA perspective, we have an open data policy. We do everything we can to take ridership data or route data or a lot of our on-time data, and we are putting it out there both in machine-readable as well as you know non-machine-readable. So that's available for everybody in our open data you know, database. Uh, we also have got a regional ITS group going on and which we got the 15 cities in the county and we're working on kind of how could we take data and make it more regional and maybe make more like a smart region out of it. And so how can we collect information and have, a, you know, like, you know, so if it happens to be you know, like city data that might be on humane society or things like that, what would that data look like? And then could all the, of the different cities put their data in the same format and then we can make that available then as a region instead of a single you know, entity. So that's some of the things that we're working with and we have a very active team going on with all the different 15 cities in the county. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so I find that there are a couple of really interesting issues that have arisen over the last 10 years in the space of data, particularly as it relates to transportation. Um, I think that there are two major challenges that cities face. One is that they have a lot of infrastructure that they manage um, that is not necessarily easily accessible when it comes to data. It hasn't been quantified. Um, for example, curb space is, is a very common one, or parking regulations. There's no easy way in most cities to determine what are all the parking regulations on specific streets. Uh, and so that's a major challenge and major undertaking of cities to basically digitalize um, information about our infrastructure. The other major challenge um, is that there's a lot of data that's being generated in the private sector that the public sector has no access to, for which it would be very useful to have access to um, in order to design cities in the way that people would actually like to move around. Um, so just as a historical example, I used to work on the regional model for the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. This is the region that oversees all of the transit agencies in the Bay Area. We built out the forecast for the next 30 years. And we were using data that was about five years old to build that forecast. They still use that same data set. And now it's about 10 years old. And that was really the impetus for me starting Populous is that I realized there are a lot of other ways to collect data that are cheaper, faster, that can provide cities with more insights uh, as the ecosystem evolves much more rapidly than it ever did before. Yeah, um, great, and I will just say that if you wanna read a single study on the TNC, the Uber and Lyft impact, uh, Regina's really is the best study. When I saw the methodology, it was like, aha, finally. Uh, and it came out about the same time as the Rocky Mountain Institute came out with the worst methodology ever, <laughs> saying how it's fixing our climate problems. Um, so, uh, I, I would uh, just add that uh, we, we do need to get agencies together uh, to uh, figure this problem out at a regional scale in the Bay Area. Uh, in addition to MTC, which Gina worked for, we have a lot of county transportation agencies. Transform is right now uh, helping to catalyze a project uh, between the ones on the 101 corridor uh, in San Francisco's San Mateo and Santa Clara, including VTA. Uh, we had our first meeting yesterday and the data came up as kind of one of the most important things. It turns out each of them has purchased, you know, data from uh, some companies to, to look at origins and destination. Uh, they have kind of different takes so we can't combine it. They, uh, some of them also have had access to some of Google and Facebook and other of the shuttle data, but it was only for a specific use and can't be used for analysis on the 101 corridor in our purposes unless they come up with a new agreement. Uh, and so, uh, so I, I would just put it forward that as public agencies, it's something that I think we're gonna be much more successful at if uh, we can get some of the largest cities and some of the largest agencies to come together, come to an essentially agreements 
about what are the most important things to collect, uh, and then uh, really try to create a common platform for collecting it. I know that there are some some efforts underway, but I just have to say that they, they really uh, are going to be critical if we're going to be able to uh, to, to crack this nut. Yeah. Appreciate that, Stuart. I'm I'm going to come back to you. You know, we've touched on uh, accessibility a couple times and accessibility in, in multiple formats, right? And I think uh, when we spoke before, uh, you had a very good, broad definition and the various you know subsets of uh, what that could mean, who that affects. I think um, could you dive into the accessibility question that we're seeing? How you know the the problems of making sure or the challenges of making sure that everybody is brought along in new models of transportation and, mo and mobility yeah sure uh, uh, thank you for that I, I think that when, often when transform starts to look at these issues we start as the uh, looking at and use the kind of broad term of disadvantaged communities and for us it's often meant uh, kind of the lowest income communities communities of color that have borne the brunt of transportation systems that haven't served them with limited access to opportunities. Uh, but uh, the other thing that increasingly we need to look at uh, is, one is obviously with the aging population is uh, uh, kind of senior accessibility. And this used to mean, uh, uh, you know, can they still drive? And if not, what is the kind of shuttle or pickup service of choice? And what's happening now, of course, is uh, we're, we're, we're facing a whole different world where kind of whether you have a smartphone uh, is becoming really primary and whether you have a broad range of transportation options. So, so that subset uh, of, of people aging into their 80s and 90s uh, and what does their access look like uh, is important. There's increasingly alternatives to the smartphone, but they're not as smart they're not as easy, uh, you know, they're having call-up services for, for certain. So that's one. Uh, and another is youth. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're coming up with a generation that uh, is, you know, has the potential to be the first generation in uh, 100 years that really doesn't see, uh, you know, a car as the ultimate way to get around their, or vehicle ownership. And... Uh, you know, we're seeing that declining vehicle ownership that I mentioned, uh, but thinking about kind of safety and how access access for youth is, is the other one that uh, I, I think is kind of often left out of transportation planning that should be an important part of it. Uh, yeah. And on that, you know, and Gary, please feel free to jump in here, but how are, you know, how are public sector organizations, departments of transportation or other city government uh, organizations responding or engaging with some of these questions? Well, accessibility, well, first off, you know, VTA is also the paratransit provider for the, the, uh, the county down here. So accessibility is definitely on our mind a lot and constantly. And the problem we've got is, you know, once again, the same problem we have with everything else, you know, it, it's a very, you know, spread out. Everything is spread out. There's very little concentration or it's very weak concentration. So where... You know, you know, the accessible public, you know, is living or where the accessible public needs to go, you know, isn't down the street. It's across town or it's across the county, you know, the, and and so that creates, you know, a lot of an is, a lot of issues and a lot of cost of moving, you know, accessible passengers from one end to the other. And so one of the things that, you know, we would like to also see would be more automation and better automation for the accessible public so that vehicles, you know, so like as an example, as autonomous vehicles become smarter drivers, can they also be smarter in helping and dealing with passengers? So can the vehicle, you know, have cognitive thinking and talk to the passenger or can it understand, you know, without asking the passenger, Hey, yeah, I know that uh, you know that I need to lower the ramp because this person's blind, and I can look at the seats and I can tell them which seats open and guide them to the you know the uh, proper seat. So things like that would would make the whole you know I think the accessibility for the customer you know so much better. We've done uh, some pilots on our uh, paratransit vehicle where we actually added a monitor um, or a, actually it was a tablet in the back of the paratransit vehicle. And we showed the passenger where they were. We showed the passenger, you know, the path of, of and how long, what the ETA was. 
of how long they were going to get there, and at the end, they could rate their ride. And they just loved it. <laughs> and that, now we just have to find money to do it. But anyway, uh, but it's things like that, I think, that we can do for, you know, to give the, you know, the passengers that need that little extra help and, and interest can, can really do make their lives so much better. Oh, yeah. So I, I guess I think about accessibility in, through five different metrics, um, and we measure these through populace and provide data to cities. Um, the first are physical disabilities. So there are a certain portion of people that, for instance, obviously are not able to use scooter share services or bike share services, um, or maybe even have difficulty using an Uber or Lyft. Um, the second is smartphone access, which Stuart speak, mm -hmm. spoke to. Um, I'm actually surprised that I, I don't think the census measures yeah. smartphone access. Yeah. This is a very poor data out there on what percentage of people actually have smartphones or not. I think that it's hard to find a store that won't sell you a smartphone, but I mean, we would like to have better evidence <laughs> and real data. So we measure that. Um, the other is banking access. So a lot of these services require that you have a credit card and there are a certain portion of Americans that are unbanked. Um, the fourth is income level. So clearly there are a lot of services that just simply aren't accessible because people can't afford them. Um, that I found to be the case with a lot of ride hailing services. Um, and then the fifth is um, population density or uh, geographic neighborhood type. So um, one really interesting example is that Chicago recently um, with the dockless bike share systems, um, previously they had built up a very large docked bike share system in Chicago and it wasn't available on the south side. And this was a very you know, political issue for quite a, quite a period of time. Um, and as all these new dockless systems came in, um, they were looking at basically how to extend those services and essentially force them through some geofencing to provide services in some of those regions. So I think a lot of new mobility services can be used as an opportunity. Um, those services, the dockless bike share systems are definitely cheaper and more flexible to experiment um, with different neighborhood types, whether it be neighborhood types that are different because they're less dense, uh, low income, or, or other. And then I'll, I'll just add, the, the other big barrier that is coming in is language sometimes. And, um, you know, in Spanish, Chinese, and some other languages that uh, still dominate, this, as the private sector is rolling things out, it, uh, it needs to be public, public agencies have become very accustomed. VTA has quite a few languages if you look at their materials. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so we need to keep up with, with that as well. So there's a whole host of, uh, of solutions and complications that we're talking about here, depending on these different aspects of, uh, of accessibility that we're talking about. Well, it's, you know, different vehicle types, it's different, uh, service types, it's software, it's, you know, and it's small features as well that, you know, make or break that experience for different, uh, sets of, you know, different, uh, subsets of the population, I should say. Well, Go this, ahead, Gary. If I could add that, you know, but, but technology in reality could reduce a lot of these things, mm -hmm. these shortcomings. A driver may know one or two, maybe at best case, three languages. But theoretically, I think the next generation of, you know, the, the next, you know, the computers we have even today could theoretically understand 20 languages. And we do speak some 20 languages in the Bay Area. Three are dominant, but there are 20 total that's really being spoke, you know, considerably. And so, you know, if, if we can just, you know, get the right computer, you know, the right, you know, automation and the, you know, you know, and effort applied to the problem, we could really improve the, you know, the, you know, the accessibility to those individuals. So, uh, I want to turn the conversation to one of the themes that we've touched on um, in passing, which is the climate and uh, well, climate change responsibilities uh, shift away from fossil fuels. Um, and Gary, you mentioned uh, the electric bus fleet that uh, the city owns. Let's let's start with you. You know, what's the what's the responsibility of the public sector or the city, as you see it, with regard to um, climate responsibilities and transportation? Well, well, being you know that you know. We believe that we own a lot of responsibility in that, both as a congestion management agency, as well as and the city of San Jose, which I can speak, you know, help, you know, talk about. Um, so, you know, we want, you know, a cleaner, better life city and the area, and so I think that's partly what we're trying to accomplish here is to, you know, you know, diesel buses, you know, the older, very older diesel buses that were retiring generate considerable amount of pollution. 
We then migrated back in 2004 to the hybrid, the clean energy diesels. And now, like I said, we're trying to get rid of the, the last few diesels for the electric vehicles, which are zero emissions completely. So I think all those things are, you know, are helping. We've got, uh, you know, hydrogen cars for doing some paratransit work. We've got, you know, the city and, you know, just as purchasing paratransit or uh, Portera electric buses to run at the airport. So I think that you're seeing, you know, especially here in California, the problem is if you leave California, there is such a big diversity of what we're doing here and in, you know, Missouri or Illinois or other states that, you know, we, you know, we get a little, we think that this is the way the country is, but it actually is not. I mean, the number of charging stations that we have, you know, in the Bay Area dwarfs is an example, you know, what would might be in Chicago or St. Louis or other, you know, other cities like that. And just the number of, you know, I mean, every time I, you know, you know, you know, you get, you know, you walk out your car, you know, your door and that there are, I mean, how many stickered electric vehicles do you see on the, you know, you know, we, you know, we have them everywhere and other states haven't even thought of, you know, stickering the uh, EVs so that they get to drive in the, you know, you know, the HOV lanes for free, right? So, Gary, can you you walked us through some of those uh, technological uh, preferential changes over the years for the uh, buses? Can you walk us through what's changed about you know the underlying technology or um, other factors that have made us go from you know diesel to cleaner diesel to electric? Well, I have to start with the state. So there are definitely you know the state has been consistently putting regulations on all of the uh, transit agencies across the state. Uh, matter of fact, I think the latest initiative is, is that we have to be a you know, completely clean fleet by I think it's 2040 and that. Um, so all of our, you know, you know, no matter what fossil fuels you might be burning, you know, you, they, they all have to be gone by that time frame. So if you think about it, that's a pretty sizable investment for any transit agency since a uh, you know, an electric bus basically isn't cheap. They're like $800,000, and you multiply that just our own by 480. You know, that's a considerable amount of money that we have to go change over as part of the fleet to go do that. And then, of course, the whole infrastructure related to that is also sizable that has to all be done. But I think that, you know, but we take that challenge as a very positive. I mean, every one of our, um, our three bus yards are all, uh, you know, have solar panels and, uh, you know, as we add electric vehicles, they're not quite zero, you know, you know, we have to add more solar panels now <laughs> to compensate. But uh, at one time they were, uh, you know, you know, you know, power neutral. And so, you know, we've, we've been, uh, you know, we've taken a, you know, reduced the amount of uh, watering and, and uh, changed the uh, shrubberies along a lot of the highways and the roadways that we do to try to make, you know, you know, conserve, you know, water and other types of, you know, climate change, you know, en enhancements. So, uh, well, you know, we, we need to go electric in every way, but we really need to go electric in, in ways that are shared uh, and getting away from solo driving. And so um, one of the things that we, we're doing, uh, it's going to be launched over the next uh, two months is uh, trying to bring some of these electric uh, shared uh, uh, opportunities to disadvantaged communities. And we just got a grant with our regional transportation agency, MTC, uh, from the state, from CARB, to put in uh, solar electric mobility hubs at affordable housing sites, uh, one in San Jose, one in Oakland, and one in Richmond, uh, and then make them available. Use the, um, you know, use that as the kind of the basis for having a good user base, but make it available to the community as well. And uh, in this way, we're not just kind of going to be exposing uh, communities that have less access to electric vehicles, but we're going to be doing that exposure in a way that, that allows them to reduce their own vehicle ownership uh, and, uh, and, and test, out, uh, uh, test out not only electric vehicles, but there'll be e-bike share and other things like that. So, so I think, you know, as we're thinking about electric, uh, we need to think about as uh, Lyft and Uber and other fleets uh, uh, come online as they get away from their own uh, individually owned vehicles, uh, by, owned by individuals, uh, that those should be electric. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, in terms of cities, 
we really need to make sure that uh, that shared vehicles are getting priority. Uh, you know, VTA's ridership loss is due in no small part because they get no priority on almost any road. Uh, and, you know, in fact, have to pull off. And then I took VTA here today, VTA yeah. and BART, and, you know, pull off and then wait for a minute or two of traffic to go by before they can pull back in. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, their speeds have gone down on El Camino from, I think, 14 miles an hour to about nine or yes. so, give or something take. Like, something like that, yes. uh, uh, Almost a, uh, a very large drop. And so, so if we don't really change the way we're giving priority on our streets, on our curbs, as Regina mentioned, then we're gonna be into a future with a lot of congestion. Uh, and even if it's electric and even if it's autonomous, uh, it could be a really ugly future. So I can kind of comment on the electric yeah, electrification absolutely. question. I think um, one of the really big positive benefits of the really rapid adoption of shared mobility um, is that if more people are deciding not to own a vehicle and more vehicles that are being driven on roads are in fleets, in many ways, it makes it a lot easier for, say, the California Air Resources Board to regulate those fleets. So you mentioned that you had how many buses in 480, San, 480 in San Jose. There are an estimated 45,000 Uber and Lyft cars that drive in San Francisco downtown every yep. day. So that's a lot of cars that the state could decide to regulate must be electric. And that's actually kind of a positive thing um, because it allows regulators to be able to help accelerate that technology. It also gives cities um, and companies that are focused on building charging infrastructure more confidence that there are, are going to be um, vehicles that are going to use that infrastructure in a concentrated fashion, um, whether it's designed in disadvantaged communities or in core city centers or everywhere. So I think there are a lot of positive outcomes there. I would comment, I thought it was interesting that um, in the panel earlier that uh, George from you know Panasonic commented that they were going to be testing an electric autonomous vehicle. And we haven't really heard that much about, you know, about most everybody that's running their uh, autonomous vehicles are all basically uh, got some kind of, uh, you know, fossil fuel driven, you know, vehicles. So that's interesting. <laughs> That's a, that's a very interesting point. And also, uh, Regina, you mentioned you know, the regulation of the TNCs. We talked about it from a data side of, uh, well, maybe it wasn't quite regulation, but you know, agreements between cities. Um, there's, a, there was a, there's a draft bill in the Senate, the exact numbers slipped my mind, for exactly this, right? Regulation of the TNCs. For electrification. Uh, well, it's, yeah, it's zero emissions, yeah. right? And, and um, for background, I believe it's what 20% by 2023, mm -hmm. and then r ratcheting to 100 by 2030. One interesting assumption that I think we make is that it's going to be battery electric. Yeah. Uh, this is a you know, coming out of left field, but is there a case for hydrogen to be made, and whether it be the private side of things or the public side? <laughs> <laughs> Well, running hydrogen buses, which we did, <laughs> and that, you know, you know, there's, you know, hydrogen, there are still a lot of issues related to hydrogen, and it's, you know, it is very flammable, and if you park your, you know, hydrogen car in your garage and it has a major leak, you know, it forces all the air out of your garage, by the way. Um, so there are, are issues with hydrogen that I'm, I'm, that yes, you can get more mileage, out of a you know out of a fuel tank of hydrogen, but you know there are still definitely a lot of you know concerns. And if you look at the if you ever gone off and checked the hydrogen fuel station that's over by the airport, it it is not a simple tank in the ground with a hose you know that kind of thing. There's there's a a lot to building a hydrogen fueling station. I think there's just a lot further to go. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot more players, um, both in, particularly I would say on the vehicle fuel train development side, um, a more diverse set of players who are developing electric vehicles and then on the fast charging side as well um, that are developing that infrastructure. And so it's clearly much further along and maybe there's an opportunity, but um, I think obviously it's much more risky for fleets to try to think about those as an option. Yeah. In terms of that legislation, though, that's a, a perfect example of one where, where the, the author, Skinner, is approaching the issue from just that one perspective of can we change the fuel source. 
Um, and so we're actually in conversation with Skinner's office right now saying, can we serve multiple purposes? This is, so is a great segue from what I was saying just before. Why don't we have them be able to get some benefit for promoting shared rides? And increasingly they are, uh, but it's still a very small proportion of their overall uh, service that kind of once you get outside of San Francisco. Uh, and, uh, and so we're actually have proposed to Skinner's office that um, uh, because, of course, Uber and Lyft are trying to get those numbers ratcheted down from the current 20% by 2023. We said, how about if the shared component, the shared rides don't count towards their overall uh, quota? And because I, for one, would rather have two or three people in a Toyota Camry than have three solo drivers in, you know, electric, an electric vehicle causing congestion for everybody needing all of those batteries. And at some point, there becomes a climate impact on the production, use, and disposal of the batteries and the vehicles. And so, um, so, so again, kind of if you're, uh, you know, in, in policy, let's try to figure out in all of these how we are, are achieving multiple objectives when we're promulgating any. I think it's a really fascinating set of chickens and eggs in many regards. It's not just one or two. Um, but with the infrastructure versus the, uh, it, when we look at the hydrogen or the battery side of things, the infrastructure versus the, uh, the user base and developing both at the same time is, is kind of a terrifying challenge and a risk to take yes, on from, from a private sector or public sector perspective. Um, I will say I am, yeah, it's one of the interesting things is thinking about uh, the electrification of trans, well, sorry, the shared autonomous electric model and increasing uh, increasing the capacity factors essentially for vehicles and what that might mean for, uh, for fuel choices. Uh, I've said this publicly before, but you know, Ford has publicly leaned towards hybrids for their future fleet for particularly this reason because of you know, charging solutions. But again, we come back to chicken and the egg. What do we believe about future charging solutions? And you know, is it five minutes or is it five hours? And what's it gonna cost? And all those types of things that make this you know, look of five years out really hard to figure out. Um, so given that, and given that I've just said that, I'm gonna jump five years further beyond that and ask each of you, you know, in 10 years, what is public transportation? What is it going to look like? How are you gonna define it? Um, it can be technologically, whether it's you know, types of vehicles or it can be a role, uh, it can be a policy enforcer, any of those things, but pick and choose your uh, your given set before we turn it over to the audience. <laughs> Jerry, do you want to start? Sure, why not? Start? I've I done it. <laughs> yeah, no. I'll give you more time to think about it. Okay. Um, well, so I believe that you know that as the you know autonomous vehicles take over more and more, and pretty much as you know, everybody is planning on doing kind of a you know because of liability issues and all that kind of a shared autonomous vehicle. I think that'll continue to put more and more pressure on public transit. I think public transit in terms of the you know, long haul, like express, you know, express buses or you know, um, you know, BRT or BART or Caltrain will continue to do well mm -hmm. because you know, people will, you know, they'll use the, you know, the autonomous vehicles or other modes to get to the stations and that, and then, you know, transfer them where they need to go and then they'll get off there. So I think that, you know, you know, I think we'll continue to seek, I think a degradation in ridership on, on the, what I would call the, you know, the, you know, that medium, you know, where, you know, we're trying to go out in the county and pick people up and bring them in. I think on the, you know, like I said, the longer haul, the 22 or things like that, you know, we'll continue, I think, to see, you know, decent and, and solid ridership on those kind of things. So I think you're going to see it's a kind of a mixed bag, and I think that transit is going to have to kind of reinvent itself a little bit. So it may not be 40-foot buses, you know, you know, it may be smaller vehicles, and we might be able to, if we can automate the ADA functionality, we could actually integrate, you know, paratransit into a first and last mile solution. And we're going to stop calling it public transit, right? We're going to start calling it public mobility. Yes. And VTA is going to partner and be partnered with the scooter services and everything else. And, uh, and it's gonna be uh, just all very integrated. And, and the thing I think we're all gonna be looking out for is then what do we do with this huge amount of funding that has already come 
uh, VTA has ongoing operating funding from sales tax and other means. And how do we repurpose some of that uh, if it's not going to 480 buses, but 250 or 260 in a way that the community really helps to decide and the way that the most disadvantaged communities really help to finally increase their access. Uh, and because they have it pretty bad right now, a lot of people have it bad, I think, uh, there is a huge opportunity in five or 10 years uh, to, to have much better access for almost every member of the community, but it's gonna mean a real pain. It's gonna be a real pain for labor unions who are gonna have a very hard time uh, over the next five to 10 years with giving up some of that uh, funding. Uh, and uh, we work closely with labor uh, and are also telling them that it, it's just not about holding on to the money. It's about this is a service that we need to provide. There's um, a lot of conversation in APTA, the American Public Transit Association, about the need for public transit organizations in the United States to transition to mobility managers. Um, and what I've found in looking internationally, most of my graduate work and dissertation was focused on international transit systems um, and transportation systems, is that the vast majority of transit systems that work and that are functional in a lot of parts of the world um, are not actually run by the authorities. They're actually procured by the authorities. And so the authorities, the public transit authorities, are responsible for ensuring safety, efficiency, and equity. And they design the regulations and the policies and the frameworks under which private providers can then provide the service. And so the notion that chariot or um, another microtransit, you know, privatized transit service that's emerged could be a new solution isn't really that new in most parts of the world. Um, there are lots of public authorities that procure transit services. Um, and that I think there are more players in newer technologies is a good thing. Uh, that hopefully in five years we'll see this transition and evolution of public transit in the United States shifting to being authorities that design the rules of the road, um, but that allow private operators that can provide the service more efficiently and cost effectively to actually deliver the service. I think those are three great definitions. I mean, we had concepts of you know, operators, managers, procurers, system designers all thrown out there that, yeah, I think uh, the answer's got to lie somewhere in there for uh, <laughs> but which one of those for which city and how dense that population might be all and three. all that. Yeah, right. that's going to be the, the interesting thing to watch. I would love to continue the conversation, but uh, in, in the interest of time and having leaving uh, the opportunity open for the audience to answer some questions, uh, we'll open it up to the audience. But before we do, if we could have a hand for our panelists. Thank you guys very much. Uh, Ken Pyle, VOD View. On that theme of uh, transitioning to mobility management as opposed to being the uh, run, running, you know, and owning assets necessarily, how does a trans, uh, how does an agency make that transition? I mean, it seems like it has to start at the board level uh, to to make that transition. What what's the way forward with that? Could I could you say they're being forced into it now? I mean, in terms of of it to some extent because they're needing to start to regulate. Uh, how all these new mobility companies operate on their streets. And so it, it, that is providing the template for how uh, they, uh, kind of what they would want if they had to procure. So, so, so it, it might be a little bit different than the procurement because the venture capital that's coming in is really allowing the private sector to provide all the funding. Uh, and uh, and uh, if for one great example uh, that I just, learned about yesterday, uh, the SFMTA is inviting e-scooter applications for next year and they want to have up to five operators. And they have really clear 14-page application with about 40 requirements. This is what kind of Regina is talking about that focus on equity. They've got to have a discount fare. They've got to have multiple languages. They've uh, got to have a safety component and how are they going to do the safety education and helmets. and broad set of requirements uh, and so that it doesn't matter that it's not muni scooters, uh, but they're going to be meeting public and environmental and social goals that the city has. And so then if they have funding of their own to procure a service, they're going to be able to just take that same list and, and be able to essentially transform that into a procurement list. 
I think a lot of public agencies, and Carrie, you probably know more about this than I do, already have um, a method in place for procuring services for paratransit. Virtually every city um, or every transit agency procures paratransit. Um, and there are a lot of suburban, I would say in the United States, suburban transit agencies that know that they can't really operate the services effectively themselves that also procure like 30% or more of the public transit service. So I think there are a lot that are already in place. Um, I think for them, one of the biggest questions and issues um, are the regulations around labor um, that have emerged. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I think Sam, you know, Licardo earlier today even, you know, commented, because he's also our board chair, that we have an ad hoc committee going on, you know, that has been meeting now for quite a few months, that is actually trying to, you know, address that exact issue. And, and how does VTA need to restructure itself to become a you know you know leaner better organization that is better supporting the customer. Uh, hi, uh, Gary Shway. So, I think the next logical question is then: Do you support do you support the concept of mobility as a service? That sounds to me like a logical extension of what you're talking about as far as reshaping VTA and reshaping public service and having everything branded and kind of under an umbrella that where, where you know, a system is truly integrated. And if you do support this concept of mobility as a service, how far do you think we are away from that? How easy can we get there? Or how hard can we get, will it, how much will it take to get there? And this is actually for, for all of you. Yep. <laughs> well, I'll go, yeah. So mobility as a service, you know, the same problem that uh, Uber and Lyft have right now, as you notice, they're not making money right now, right? So mobility as a service is a tough, tough business. Our paratransit service really is mobility as a service. I mean, you, you know, you call up and we come pick you up, you know, personally, and we drop you off where you need to go. Um, we ran our flex service, so we pretty much understand and the problem with that is, is that you know we've got to bring it. We've got to be able, just like everybody's aware, we have to be able to bring that cost model to something that is a little more affordable to make that model work well. But that's where it's going. I'm gonna first start with the potential different definitions of mobility as a service. So, <laughs> um, I guess I think a lot of people use the term mobility as a service to refer to the notion that people are not owning their cars and using mobility as a service as in Uber and Lyft in personal vehicles. Um, public transit has kind of always been mobility as a service. Flights are mobility as a service. You don't buy a plane and fly it. At least the vast majority of us don't. Um, but I think what a lot of people also like to call mobility as a service is this notion of an integrated multimodal. You have maybe an app that shows you all your transportation options and you're able to book and pay for everything in one place. And I think that that notion and idea is something that a lot of transportation academics have loved for <laughs> at least a decade now. Um, and there are some new efforts to try to build that concept of mobility as a service, including Movil, um, the mobility services arm under Daimler, including WIM out of uh, Helsinki in Finland. Um, and I think that in the context of, let's say, the United States or the Bay Area, I think one of the really big challenges is, do, would we really want a mobile app for San Jose and for San Francisco, or should that be a regionally coordinated thing? Um, and do we really need different ones for different cities in the US? I mean, I think those are some of the big, gnarly questions that people are trying to sort out. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and we see Uber and Lyft running to try to become your mobility as a service by grabbing up others that they'll be able to put under their wing, uh, like jump bikes or get around or rent a car. Uh, and so, so the race is on. But I, I tell you, I, I don't know that there'll ever be a, a single app. But I was interesting. I was taking a lift the other day and talking with the driver. And he was telling me that he uh, essentially, there's a third party app right now. They used to have to try to switch between, quickly turn off their Uber uh, you know, phone if they got a lift ride and then turn it back on as soon as their ride was done and everybody was having all these complications. And now there's now third party apps that coordinate between the two, one called Maestro. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it uh, links them. And I think we just might end up with some technology solution like that, where you never end up with one single app that rules them all, one that binds them. Uh, but you, you, uh, you, you end up with a few and, and, and some ways that they're coordinated. 
Agreed. I think um, we are out of time, unfortunately. Our panelists will hopefully have a couple minutes to hang out up here during our break. Uh, but thank you very much to both you guys, the audience, as well as our panelists.